Prayer manifests the will of God in our life to overflowing, to breakthroughs, to miracles, through deliverance of all of those things, that power of God's prayer in our life can manifest itself. Open your Bibles to Ephesians, the sixth chapter, if you will. I'm going to kind of, uh, in fact, everybody say, get ready. Amen. Now look at your neighbor and say, he's going to step on your feet this morning a little. Just go ahead and tell him that. Because so often what we forget, honestly, is that, how many of you know, Church isn't always to make us feel comfortable. Church is to bring the will of God to be imparted to our life. So, Ephesians 6, 18 tells us after we talked about the armor of God, it begins to tell us that prayer, our prayer life means something to God. You know, if a person has a prayer life and that prayer life is going on and and it's being manifested and it's bringing forth things and we're lifting things up so that the Lord may know. The word says we have not because we ask not. But also we have to understand the real power of prayer and what prayer can do in our life. Prayer manifests the will of God in our life to overflowing, to breakthroughs, to miracles, through deliverance of all of those things, that power of God's prayer in our life can manifest itself. And this is why it's so important for a, a place to be united and have the power of God. A couple that prays together will stay together. And I mean, that's a known fact. We can say what we want about life, but if you pray with your mate, the chances of separation is almost none. Where sadly enough, in our world today, over 50% of people end up in a divorce. And I don't say God can't forgive you or maybe there's abusiveness or whatever's going on. But prayer changes lives and the greatest thing it changes is you. Amen. Now with that being said, Paul says this in Ephesians after he talks about the armor of God. Praying always with all prayer, supplication in the spirit, being watchful to this end, with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. How many of the saints? All. Just turn to your neighbor and say, that includes you. Exactly. Just tell them that. <laughs> now the power of that is this. We talked last week about how we all need one another. In fact, look at your neighbor and tell them, you need me. Just tell them that. <laughs> People are not doing that. <laughs> now look on the other side and say, I need you. Go ahead. <laughs> Seems like when I say, I had the same response in the first service, that's what's funny. When I said, say, I need you, everybody was fine with that. But when I said, you need me, uh, all of us kind of giggle and laugh. And it kind of reminds me of being in high school trying to talk about sex. Nobody really knows how to talk about it, so they laugh. <laughs> well, it's kind of like people don't realize synergy is one of the most powerful words God ever used. That a house divided cannot stand but a house united cannot fall. And the power of that is we need one another. Synergy means that it's powerful the greater we are. If one can put a thousand to flight, the Old Testament says, and two, just multiplying that by one person can put 10,000 to flight. Now how many of you know, now look at somebody and say, you need me. Because you really have the power together to do more than you have separately. And synergy means we see the greater of the whole more powerful than the individual. And so often we forget that. But this is telling us about prayer. What does this mean in prayer? How does this work? I mean there's corporate prayer. But today what I want to talk to you about is more individual prayer. What happens in your prayer life when you pray? We need one another, but let's say you're home on your knees, we sang about it, we have the power of it. But we need to begin to understand that our prayer life has everything to do with how we walk in our world that we live. 
In fact, let me show you something. In Mark, when Jesus talks about prayer, he brings something out that is very unique. And this is what he says. And whenever you stand praying, if you have anything against another one, any other one, forgive him that your heavenly Father also will forgive your trespasses. Amen. So in other words, there's one thing that can hinder our prayer, and that is unforgiveness. It's quiet in this church now all of a sudden. Why? Because unforgiveness is something that comes out of our emotions and our feelings and our hurts, our disappointments, our letdowns. And really, the sad part about unforgiveness, if you carry unforgiveness around, your prayers have no more power than just your voice. But when you're willing to forgive others, I told you I was going to step on your feet today. I know this is going to be one of those quiet sermons. But on Friday, I'll just tell you this. On Friday, why I'm doing that, turn to Matthew chapter 6, verse 9. It's the Lord's Prayer. And I want to show you something in this. On Friday, I was going to add a few points to my message. I was praying every week. I kind of pray about what God wants to lead me. On Friday night, or Friday afternoon, I sit down. And I begin to get a few thoughts, and I will tell you, the Holy Spirit showed up in that room, and five and a half la hours later, I was still writing things out. I've never heard this preached, uh, so I wanted to make sure, truthfully, I wanted to make sure I felt it was biblical. If you know anything about uh, the way to study the Bible, the way to preach the Bible, the way to manifest the Word of God, is to never just pull a scripture out, but to always look what's above that and what's after that. Because that's the subject matter that that verse is talking about. The randomness of God is not like words we talk. We can jump from one subject to another. But God, when he's talking in his word, every theologian will tell you, every seminary where you go to, that will be the first. That's 101. You always read what's before and what's after a verse. And that gives you the crux, or if you will, the power of that verse. And so let's look at this for a minute. In this manner, therefore, pray, our Heavenly Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive our debts as we forgive our debtors. As we forgive our debtors. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Now there's two things taking place here. And let me show you something. Now let me read to you the scripture that follows this. You know what it says? For if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive your trespasses. But if you do not forgive men their trespasses, neither will your heavenly Father forgive your trespasses. So unforgiveness can literally stop the prayer God left with the church. Boy, it's quiet in here. So what happens? What begins to happen whenever we don't forgive the seriousness of that. What really happens, what transpires in our life if we hold bitterness and unforgiveness and hate in our heart? What we do is we live now out of our emotions instead of the will of God. And even when we pray, I believe it cancels the prayers that we lift up to God. Now that's pretty serious. But that's what the Lord began to show me immediately after he tells us and leaves to the body of Christ how to pray at the end of that his disciples were not asking what would stop prayer but he would not be our savior if he would not tell us what would hinder our prayers as well as how to pray so unforgiveness literally out of the mouth of God out of the mouth of Jesus tells us that when we don't forgive we cancel the Lord's prayer in our life now what does all of that mean? Let's kind of break this down for a moment. Let's, let's kind of look at some things. Go ahead, Pastor Mike, if you'll flip that past. 
I want um, you to see this. Now this is a healthy, spirit-led, spirit power God living in our life. And this is how our life operates. It's like a circle. And it has four equal things that operate in our life. First is our mind, our emotions, and our will. And when we're willing to forgive, when we're willing to let go of the problems, when we're willing to release the person that really gave, if you will, uh, gave us a hurt or a, a frustration or a disappointment, when we're willing to let them go and let them have that freedom from our own heart and our own mind, we live a healthy life. But the moment we stop doing that, something happens. And this is exactly what happens. Now we start living out of our emotions and our feelings and not our mind. Because you shrink your thought pattern of knowing what God said and now you're willing to be ruled by your emotions and your will. No longer is it God's will. God's will is this. Let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus. What did Jesus say on the cross? Forgive them, Father, for they know not what they do. So in other words, if we don't do that, we don't take on the mind of Christ, we shrink our mind. Instead of thinking in the way it should spiritually, we now no longer expand our mind to God's ways. We shrink our mind and are ruled now by our emotions and our feelings. Amen. I'm preaching better than y'all are amen in here. Because I'm going to give you some stuff this morning that can absolutely change your life. And I will be very transparent. I've never heard anybody teach on this, ever. And Friday, God just had me write all this down. I called a person that I respect very much, their knowledge of the word, and I said, I feel the Holy Spirit is revealing this to me. Is this the way am I supposed to do that? Because I want to tell you, this is absolutely very serious in our life. Because I think our world, right now we live in, why we're so divided is because people will not forgive. Come on. They would rather hate, they would rather divide than be united. Come on. And a house divided cannot stand, but a house united cannot be destroyed. And so what I'm about to teach you, I believe, can carry you through life and have your prayers answered. Because what really happens is when we don't forgive that prayer stops something. So let's go back and look at the Lord's Prayer. In this manner therefore pray, our Heavenly Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Number one, what we don't understand is when we walk around with hate or unforgiveness, we can harm the people that don't know God. We can harm his name. His kingdom come, his, Lord be, his will be done, hallowed be thy name. His name now is no more holy in our life. Boy, it's quiet in here. Why? Because what happens is that's not how God would operate. And we're not operating like God would. We all know how God operated. He saved you, set you free, gave you grace. Might be hard to wrap your mind around that, but I want to tell you, without grace, none of us could be here right now. But how many of you know we need to pass that on to other people as well? That's right. yes, sir. Because when we don't, what happens is the character, nature, and will of God, because the next thing we do is we cancel out the will of God on earth as it is in heaven. How many of you know there's no unforgiveness in heaven? Come on, right. Come on can I get an amen out of that? Yeah. Well, if there's no unforgiveness in heaven, why should there be unforgiveness when it's on earth if it's have your will be done on he in heaven like it should be done on earth? The heavenly earth should understand that forgiveness is the power, is the anointing to release the enemy, the darkness, the anger, the frustration in your life. Because it releases things into our life because the will of God cannot be done. Because the name of God is not being manifested. And in the name of God, all of his healing powers, all of his delivering powers, all his covering powers are in his name. That's right. The name has more, more to do with how we live. And so it's no longer hallowed be thy name. We're just saying it's a name. Come on, Come on church. Are you out here? 
I, I told you I was going to step on your feet this morning, but we really cause the name of Jesus to be injured among people. And even in ourselves, do we stop that? Do, does anybody in here want the will of God? Yes. Well, if you really want the will of God, then I want to tell you, you cannot hold unforgiveness in your heart. Because if you hold unforgiveness in your heart, the Bible tells us God can't forgive us. Does anybody need forgiveness in here? Yes. Well, then guess what? We should pass that right on to somebody else. Amen. We need to be a conduit. Amen? Amen? Why? Because then we're no longer, we're like that whole person. We're, we, we will have emotions. We will have a will. But our mind can be renewed in God and His power. And that mind that was in Christ can be in us. And when we're on the cross, when we're de hurt or defigrated, if you will, or put down, or somebody brings a name against you, how many of you know you can say, Father, forgive them for they know not what to do, and you can release that in your life. Amen. Come on, that was a weak amen. Give me an amen for that. <laughs> and I know this is real because it's so hard. Number two, give us this day our daily bread. Unforgiveness affects every day of your life. Give us this day. Everybody say, this day. This day. You choose this moment to forgive, and guess what? Tomorrow will be better. Give us this day our daily bread. So what does it affect? Number one, it affects really our daily life. Every day of our life is affected when we won't forgive. Somebody told me after the first service that someone in their family was holding a grudge that happened to them 50 years ago. She said, when they told me about it, I didn't even remember it happened. So who was really in prison? The person that wouldn't forgive, not the person that did the deed. So often we think, I, remember, I used to say this, but it's so true. When Sandy and I would have a disagreement, I would always, years ago, go sleep on the couch. Look at your neighbor and say, you really did that? Yeah, I did that because I was selfish and I only wanted what I wanted. And you know, while I was laying on the couch, I would always want to hear, Oh, honey, come back to bed. Oh, please, will you come back to bed? You know what I would hear? It was really affecting her, wasn't it? My unforgiveness was really, a f come on church, I'm preaching right where we live. Man, it was really affecting her. Man, I was really having her tormented. <laughs> How stupid is that for us to do that in life? It affects every day of our life. When we don't, we cancel out, give us this day. Why? Because our days should be filled with joy, unspeakable and full of glory. Our days should be full of happiness and goodness and blessings of God. But when we won't forgive, we cancel that out because now we're living on our hurts, our emotions, our feelings, and we're allowing the enemy to rob us what God has for us. He has now taken that. Isn't it time we get back to resist the devil, draw near to God, and he will flee from us, the enemy? Yes. If you really want the enemy to flee, I don't know what's happened to you. I know this is a hard thing to do, but I am telling you, it will block your prayers. Number two, it also blocks the provision of God. People that are bitter and angry never get ahead in life. Because that stuff just manifests itself in your life. Why do I say that? Because it says, give us this day our daily bread. Bread, anytime you see it in the New or Old Testament, always had to do with provision. Because they didn't want everything sometimes all of us Americans want. All they wanted is to be able to meet their needs and have bread on their table so they would survive. Even when God blessed them in the wilderness, wandering around the Mount of Sinai, what began to happen? They asked for God to provide for them, and what did he send them? Manna, or bread, every day, six days. On the seventh, he could gather up enough 
for Sunday, or back then it was Saturday, because God's day was holy, and they couldn't do anything on that day, so they could collect on Friday. But guess what? If they collected on Thursday, by Friday morning it was rotten. That's right. True story. Look it up for yourself. Why? Because we need to understand daily bread. Daily forgiveness. Daily provision. Quit worrying about tomorrow. I'm not saying to don't make plans to help yourself. But deal with today and you will be a lot better. Because tomorrow has enough problems of its own. That's what the word literally says. If God cared for the sparrows and cares for anything on the earth, wouldn't he do the same for you? Put your mind to rest, forgive people, and move on and receive the provision of God. One of the reasons why people can't receive provision is because God could never give them enough to provide because their emotions are all messed up. I'm pro oh, I'll try that over here. Their emotions are all messed up. <laughs> I mean, let's face it, it's not a sermon we want to hear but with, with that scripture at the end of this, how do we interpret that if the law is to study that which is before and that that is after, and he says, your father can't forgive you if you don't forgive others, then that means it cancels out that which God is trying to teach us about prayer and that anointing. Amen? Amen. And then Matthew 12, and forgive us our debt as we forgive our debtors. Now, I'm going to try to read some of this. It's pretty lengthy, so... But this is the greatest story, I believe, in the New Testament for this, this subject. And let me just kind of preface it. A king or a kingdom, well, let me just read it. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like a certain man or king who went out to settle accounts with his servant. And when he had began to settle accounts, one was brought to him who owed him 10,000 talents. But as he was not able to pay it, his master commanded that he be sold his wife, his children, and all his goods. Pretty powerful. But look at this. Now the kingdom of heaven is like this. That's what he said. And that payment be made. The servant therefore fell down before him saying, Master, have patience with me. Everybody say patience. Amen. This is the kind of patience James is talking about in James 1 when it said, Cast it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that trials will work out patience in your life. And he goes on in that same verse to say, That's how wisdom comes. Isn't that power? I mean, that is so powerful. <laughs> how many times have I said, Lord, have patience with me? <laughs> Come on, church, are you there? Amen. Now look at this. Then the master of the servant was moved with compassion. Everybody say compassion. Now if you look up the definition of compassion, one of the def definitions of that is forgive. To forgive. Have compassion. He was moved by his emotions, but he had a balanced mind. He wasn't so caught up in what the servant owed him, like the human mind wants to do. And what he did is he did this. Release him, and he forgave him the debt. He just said, say, well, I'm going to be patient with you. Go and pay me when you can. He said, no. When unforgiveness is there, it releases completely. Hello? <laughs> but that servant went out and found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii. Now a denarii is like a penny. But this man owned, owed 10,000 talents. It was like somebody that owed him a hundred dollars and he was just forgiven 10,000 talents. How easy it is for our equation to move into the decision. And look what he does. But the servant went out and found one who's following his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii. And he laid hands on him and took him by the throat. Wow. Come on, church. Saying, pay me what you owe me. So he fell down, the servant, falling down at his feet and begged him, saying, 
Have patience with me, and I will pay you all. And he went, would not, but when he threw him down, he threw him into prison till he could pay his debt. Now look at this. So when the servants saw this, what had happened and been done, they were very grieved. How many of you know people are watching? Come on church, are you out there? Why do I say we can hurt the name of the Lord? Because people are watching. What happened when those servants seen, they also, you know, we talk about, oh, come serve our God, he's so great, he forgave me, he loves me so much, he was crucified on the cross for me. Oh, but somebody that owes me something, somebody that did something wrong to me. But they don't understand what I went through. No, I, let me ask you, when was the last time you were hanging on a cross? Uh, anybody in here hung on a, been nailed to a cross that I would like to see your hand? Okay, then don't give me that stuff. I love you, but that doesn't matter to God. Everybody say hard. But it's true, isn't it? What a great story. I mean, what a great way to illustrate this for us. So we don't fall into this. And he goes on. After he had called him, he said to him, You wicked servant, I forgave you all your debt because you begged me. Should you not, not also have compassion? Everybody say, should I not have forgiveness? God forgave me. I don't have a right to hold on to that. I mean, okay, now is this the Word of God? Yes. Am I saying anything that's contrary to what the Word is telling us exactly? I mean, it's clear as a lit picture. Not in the midnight, but in the noon hour of exactly what our response should be. But how many of you know our world doesn't act like this? And many of us in this room have not acted like this. But we need to. Amen. Amen. And look at this. And his master was angry and delivered him to the tormentors until he should pay all that his debt to him, to, paid all his debt to him. So my heavenly father also will do to you if you do not. Everybody say strong, strong, strong. Now look in your Bible, this is all red. This is not Steve Grandy's interpretation. This is red. This is why this was hard and I want to get confirmation because I've never heard anybody preach about canceling out your prayers because you won't forgive. And all the things God wants to do for you. And can I tell you, I think this is where our world lives in America today. This is why there's so much anger and bitterness and unchristian values because the world doesn't see the church operating in this. How many more would want what we have if we operated in forgiveness? So I don't, I mean, well I do know, but I'm going to shut this down. I think we've said enough. I'm going to pick up here next week because, well, let me finish this. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. So what happens? Two things. Temptation won't leave, and deliverance doesn't happen. We're getting ready to start our new ministry, Turning Point. I believe many people become addicted or many people are addicted to unforgiveness as much as they are drugs. And that leads us to be tempted. Because we won't forgive, the enemy has a right to traffic in that. Because where unforgiveness is, God isn't. 
Because God is a giving, unforgiving God. And if that mind's going to be in us, now it'd be unfair, we're going to pick up here next week, but I want to give you the antidote, some of it anyway. Does anybody want to know how to keep that out of your life? No, I said, does anybody want to know? Because I'll just shut it down and go home. Give it to me. Let me uh, that's what I want to hear. Hallelujah. There's one way to do this and one way only, basically, to do this. Because if you don't do it in this manner, in fact, will you flip to the end of these slides for me? Are you there? Thank you. Let me write to you, let me read. Most of the time, hurts, offenses come because we do something for someone or they do something to us or for us and there is a disagreement, a lack of appreciation or approval or consideration. In fact, I, that's mainly where most offenses come because they've been hurt by someone. Correct? So I want to ask you, why are you doing, are you born again Christians in here? Everybody that's a born again Christian, raise your hand. Okay, for all of you that have your hands raised, why are you doing what you do? Because let me show you this. The Word of God tells us this in Corinthians. Therefore, whether you eat, drink, or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. Amen. Not to the glory of men, but to God. Giving no offense either to the Jew or the Gentile or the church of God. Amen. So what am I telling you? I'm telling you this in a simple capsule form. If you're doing it to God, you won't get offended. If you're doing it for your self-glory, you're going to get offended. Because God knows your heart. God knows your thoughts. God knows when you do it, you wanted to do it right. Just because people... If I allowed people words to keep me in ministry, I would have left ministry a long time ago. Because I've been told I'm wrong. I've been told you're not even scriptural. I've been told, how dare you say that I can't do that? I have been told all of these things. So if words, if I was doing this unto man, I would have quit a long time ago. But I don't know about you. I'm not doing this unto man. I have to do it unto God. And when God calls you, you can't quit because man doesn't agree with you. Or man hurts your feelings. Or some... I'm preaching pretty good here. And this is only one antidote. But this is the most important. Why do you do what you do? Do you do it to God? Or are you doing it for yourself? Because if you're doing it for God, man can't offend you. Thank you for that hearty amen. amen. Because the enemy will make sure enough people tell you you're wrong, you're missing the mark, you're not important, you know that stuff affects you. Guess what? Greater is he who is in us than he who is in the world. And I know who I'm doing things for and that's why I can't quit. I can't say quit has never came in my mind, but I will tell you, it's never dropped into my spirit. Pastor Sandy has lived with me for over 45, 47 years now. We dated three years before that. I guarantee you, you could ask her, I have never, ever once in over 30 years of ministry said, I'm quitting because that person hurt my feet. In fact, I've never said I'm quitting. Amen. Never. In 30 years. Because I learned a long time ago, unless I do it to God, it isn't worth doing anyway. Unless God build the house, it's being built in vain. Amen. And if you're going to go by accolades and praises, only your emotions can rule in that stuff. Because the moment somebody says something wrong about you or something wrong to you, you will want to give up. 
And if that comes into your life, I'm going to be honest.